Okay. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. Um, the Oxford University Space and Astronomy Society is excited to be able to put on a few talks for you this Hillary term, again, entirely online. And today we're delighted to have Professor Matthew McGillivray here with us to talk to us about hypersonic area th thermodynamics. Um, so to introduce our speaker, Professor Matthew McGillivray is head of the hypersonics research group at the Oxford Plymouth Fluids Institute. He received his Bachelor in Engineering and PhD from the University of Queensland. Over the years, he has pioneered work in high speed flow research and spacecraft aerothermodynamics and heat transfer, um, and has developed the famous high speed flow laboratory here at Oxford, which involved the installation of the iconic high density tunnel and the T6 Stalker tunnel, uh, which I'm sure we'll hear about more today. Um, Professor, I hear from your, your DPhil students that you're incredibly busy right now with testing and so on. So very, very grateful to have you and to have your time. Um, so without further delay, over to you. I think, thank you all for, for having me today. Um, I'll try and share my screen here. Um, are you able to see that? Yeah, that's great. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, really give a bit of an introduction to, to hypersonic air thermodynamics and give you a bit of a few highlights of the research we do here in Oxford um, that many of the great DPhil students we have in the lab and fourth year students um, in engineering have been involved in. Uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, if there's any questions at the end, very happy to answer anything from um, fundamental questions up to what we're up to here in the lab. Um, so without further ado, um, so a bit of a background on hypersonic vehicles. So hypersonic vehicles are those that really are flying at incredibly high speed. So five times the speed of sound. So um, at sea level here, we're talking uh, nearly um, a mile per second. Um, and they create extremely challenging fluid mechanic and high temperature gas gas effects that we as engineers have to, to deal with when we're designing a vehicle that's got to fly. Um, but these things, you know, enable us to do a lot of things. So from um, exploring our solar system to, to space travel to, you know, there's obvious defense implications of these. And you are probably all very aware of all the different great systems that um, the US, uh, our European uh, colleagues within ESA mm -hmm. have flown, um, and there's lots of new players in the game. And this is uh, really recently, we've seen a, a huge resurgence in high-speed vehicles and really the underpinning investment. Um, and that's both from a civil point of view. So uh, you would might have seen recently that the Japanese flew back um, the Hayabusa 2 um, after capturing it um, to, to development of new opportunities with you know, delivering payloads to low earth orbit or civilian transport at very high speeds, all the way through to, to defense um, requirements. And um, you know, that's really being forced um, in the West by developments um, in both Russia and China. Um, so to give you a bit of a background on what common hypersonic vehicles there are, so we've got reusable space planes. So that there, there are none of those at the moment. Um, there's quite a few concepts going around. The space shuttle was one, one of them back um, before it was retired. Um, High-speed transport. So we're talking, you know, really souped up Concord here. Um, all the way through to spacecraft, um, where we're going to enter at extremely high speeds into to not only Earth's atmosphere, but others. Um, satellites, so all these satellites that are up in space, once they come to end of life, um, there is now, um, it, by law, you have to, to actually destructively enter them. And so they'll come back at you know, 30 times the speed of sound. Um, and, but all the way through to defense systems like hypersonic glide vehicles and hypersonic cruise vehicles. Um, so if we're gonna come back to earth, um, we're gonna come back on a very, very um, fast 
um, spacecraft and we're going to enter the upper atmosphere. And as we, as we hit the atmosphere, um, we can then start producing aerodynamic lift and aerodynamic drag. Um, but whilst we're doing that, we want to keep stable, but also we have to manage that there's going to be extremely high heat fluxes when we do that. So if we look at a trajectory plot of the sort of speeds and um, altitudes where we're interested in um, for Earth trajectories, you know, over a, at the kind of more moderate speeds are uh, what it's going to take us to get up into space. Um, but when we start moving out towards the, the right in terms of the entry speed from high altitude, you can see it starts off with a space shuttle from low Earth orbit, but then you're moving out to 10 Ks a second for lunar return missions and all the way up to 15, 16 kilometers for, for Mars return and far solar system return. So the speeds are always increasing. But if we want to go to Jupiter, then we're talking stupid crazy speeds of 50 kilometers a second. So without going too deep into this slide, it's really here just to say these things are complex. Um, we're going to be producing all kinds of high temperature gas effects from, you know, lots of chemical reactions to, to generating non-equilibrium um, energy states within our gas. And the gas will start ionizing and radiating all over the place. Um, if we want to go to different um, planets, we've got to deal with very, very different uh, gases that we're flying in. Um, down at the vehicle itself, we've got a, a series of complex processes going on, um, especially when you start having an ablative heat shield. Uh, and all those things need to be uh, thought about if we're going to make, make a heat shield that will actually fly. So to, to give you a bit of an overview of, I guess, where the challenges are for, for us engineers in the room that want to go build a hypersonic vehicle, well, time, time's an obvious one. If you're flying over 4,000 miles per hour, you know, any perturbation, any change, you've got to be fast at reacting and there's just not much time to, to do any changes. So um, that's why we see a lot of very blunt vehicles that are extremely stable coming into Earth's atmosphere. Um, so if we want to fly over that huge trajectory range where you've got, you know, you're running into only a few molecules of gas all the way down to sea level, you, you've got a large range of dynamic pressures and you've got to worry about, you know, the structural loading to this vehicle, um, dynamic stability, if you start maneuvering, uh, it's extremely difficult. Um, heating. So, you know, we're going to have air hotter than the surface temperature of the sun. It's going to generate a lot of heat transfer to the vehicle. Thermochemistry, so I've already mentioned that there's just complex coupling of physical processes and uh, the chemical species that are there. And finally, we just don't have um, the capability to really perform um, high fidelity numerical simulations for these vehicles. And wind tunnel testing at actual flight conditions is just impossible. It, it's just not possible. So essentially the first time a lot of these things get tested is actually the flight, first flight test. So I'm gonna to touch on a few, few of those points because um, I don't want to keep you here all night. So we'll start off with a bit of thermochemistry. So if we think about um, a high speed vehicle, it's going to generate a shock in front of it. So a shock is generated when um, you really need to, to compress the flow to move it out of the way. So in the shocks frame of reference here, the, the gas would be coming left to right um, rather than the vehicle's frame of reference where it's flying towards the left. And as the gas passes across the shock, it's going to become very, very hot. And if we treated that as an ideal gas, which um, you might have studied um, in some of your earlier years, we'd be getting for, for entrance speeds of you know, six kilometers a second, we'd be getting up to 20,000 Kelvin. Um, but that doesn't really happen because we start getting um, chemical reactions occurring and it comes down to we, we store some of that energy by 
dissociating some of the gas and reacting it into new species. Um, so we actually get a decrease in the temperature back down to a, a lovely moderate, you know, 6,000 Kelvin. And um, so, you know, that's, that's equilibrium thermochemistry, but it's actually quite a bit harder when you start going higher and higher in speed, you need to worry about lots of more, more coupled effects which are going on. So if we look at our oxygen and nitrogen molecules, as they pass across that shock, they might become dissociated. Um, they might get energized into to higher states. So particularly um, vibrational excitation, um, and that will then take a certain resonance time for, for both those energy states to come back down to an equilibrium level with each other, but also for the, all the chemical reactions that might occur. So, you know, generation of NO plus there. And if we're going fast enough, we might even get ionization. So we'll have lots of free electrons. And if that gas gets hot enough, particularly in that non-equilibrium region, um, we will then start getting a hell of a lot of radiation from the gas itself towards the vehicle. So um, once you're over you know, 10 kilometers a second coming back to Earth, the radiation dominates the, the amount of heat flux you're getting to the vehicle. So it's actually just dominated by that hot plasma in front of the vehicle. Um, and as we move up in temperature, we're also generating different, you know, those different species. So we'll actually get radiation in different parts of the spectrum. And some of that might be absorbed um, by the gas in front of it before it reaches our vehicle, but it just depends on what's present and what speed we are and in what quantity. Um, so how we study it here in Oxford is to perform shock tube experiments. So, um, so some of our great students here have set up um, an experiment where they pass a shock down through an ambient test gas. So you can imagine instead of what's described there as a driver gas, it's analogous to us firing um, a spacecraft down our tunnel. So we set it up just like it would be um, for a flight test. So our fuel gas could be air if we're simulating earth entry, but it could be a mixture of carbon dioxide and nitrogen if we were simulating a Martian entry condition. And the shock speed is really equivalent to our uh, entry speed of our vehicle. And so we capture some of the emission of that radiation that, that's coming from that hot plasma behind the shock. And we pass it on to, to a, two spectrographs which break the light up into to wavelength and then we image it on some cameras. And if we perform some pre-calibrations of, of those cameras and the wavelength spectra, we can then actually start getting quantitative data out of these things. So um, just to show you what a test looks like, um, so, bit of slow-mo there. So, we don't even just have, we don't have a long time to capture it. So it takes us about between four to six hours to set up an experiment and we get about 20 nanoseconds of data to 200 nanoseconds of data. So a lot of brute force to get a very small amount of data, but this data is extremely valuable. Currently, where where there's only us and NASA that are capable of performing these experiments at the moment. So. Um, and there's nuances in the NASA experimental setup that they're actually very keen on us performing these because they think there's big uncertainties. And you can imagine if you, if you put a bit more um, radiation into the system or you have different thermochemistry, your aerodynamics could be off or you might be getting a much bigger heat shield than you want to. So, or you might be burning up in the upper atmosphere. None of those are good. Um, and if you do enough tests, you can build yourself a metal diaphragm stack even taller than yourself. But that's what you get after being a PhD student for four years. Um, thermal management. So if we think about what the possible temperature of our, our material could be, it's really, uh, it's nearly the post-shock temperature. There's a there's a small deviation from that, but um, so, and it, it works out, it's about linear, you know, five kilometers a second is about 5,000 Kelvin. 
possible temperature that you could get to at the surface if you actually reach um, equilibrium. Um, but we obviously have some cooling mechanisms involved, but just to think about what, what different temperatures mean, you know, we're starting to melt all metals at above, you know, 1600 Kelvin. Um, up above 2000 Kelvin, you definitely melted all metals. So, um, but if we want to be flying, you know, at two, three kilometers a second, so we want to jump on a, a nice space plane and, and ride around, or if you've got a defense application and you want to have high, high um, aerodynamic efficiency, you're going to need to get your leading edges of your vehicle much above that um, melting point of the material. So there's various choices for us when it comes to, to cooling technologies. Um, and the best being passive because they're robust, they'll work every time, um, but they're limited to, to, to lower speeds because once you get high enough, as you just saw, all of these materials start melting away. So then we can start thinking about active cooling. So where we might have um, a heat exchanger inside the, the wing itself, um, or we could have a transpirant that passes through the material and out onto the outside, creating a cool blanket around it. Um, but that, that, that allows reusability. But again, once you go high enough in temperature again, um, that won't survive. So we, we then need ablatives. And ablatives are very good because they're, they're low complexity, um, but they're always shaped changing. So you've always got a different shape of your vehicle. Um, and they're, they're just extremely difficult to model, which hopefully you'll see in a few slides time. So if we think about some of the numbers involved, um, they're, they're, they're absolutely bonkers crazy. Um, so, you know, the shuttle was just getting a moderate 0.1 to, to 1 megawatts per, per meter squared. Um, and, and that's kind of it will be dealt with, you know, you can remember the, the, the tiles on the space shuttle and a big kind of carbon bit on the front. Um, and, you know, you can see your modern gas turbine can, you know, handle those temperatures just by, by using film cooling. Um, but if we start looking across, when, when we hit Apollo, which was entering at 10 kilometers a second, you know, radiative starts taking over and you get a huge increase in the amount of radiative um, heat flux. And so by the time you're entering Jupiter at 50 k's a second, you know, you, you're taking on the convective heating that's seen by an ICDM missile and a thermonuclear explosion. You know, you've got to design a system to survive both of those things at once. Um, and it's not just about the heat flux into to the surface, it's also about the integrated heat flux. Um, because if you're using an ablator, the longer you fly it at that heat flux, the more ablation you're going to have, and therefore the more TP, the more thickness of heat shield you're going to need. So it it just so turns out that as you increase that total heat load, um, essentially you're minimizing the the mass fraction you can use for your actual payload. So really, as engineers, we're we're thinking about how can we minimize that TPS mass fraction. Um, and there's a lot of work that's needed to be done. So we do work here, like I just showed with the thermochemistry and shock tube experiments where we're trying to measure the radiation a lot more accurately so you can reduce the margins on that. Um, but it could also be to, to, to think about how do we um, get, a, get higher, a better knowledge on what that con convective heat flux is. And one of the big um, difficulties with ablators in themselves is the, just the pure complexity of all the processes going on at once. So I thought I'd put two equations in this presentation. Um, sorry about that. Um, but it's more just to highlight all the different things going on. So the top equation is saying, how much is the heat flux into the surface of the ablator? So you've got radiation from the gas coming in. You've got convective heat flux due to, to the hot gas passing over the top of it. You can have an oxidation heat flux. Because you're starting to, to pyrolysize your um, TPS and that um, epoxy resin is starting to come out, 
you can actually get combustion of it, which then adds an additional heat flux in. You can have catalytic recombination of your um, of all these species, which you've you know heated up to incredible temperatures and dissociated. Um, then you've got some bits that reduce. So we could melt. So that's going to absorb a bit of energy. We can, um, because we're passing, blowing a gas out on the surface, that's kind of like a gas turbine's film cooling system. And because this material is getting really, really hot, it can re-radiate back out. Um, so we can get somewhere. And similarly, the heat flux actually going in, we've really got, you know, it, it's the conduction going into the surface can really only be going to three places, right? So. And the, the internal convection is really just that colorless gas, which will be a bit colder than the, um, the, the, the leftover fibers, which it's passing through. But ultimately these things are just, you know, it, it, it blows my mind every time I see these, they're just super complex and we're still modeling them with very simple empirical correlations, which just wash over all of these physical processes and we tune them to, to one set of experiments at the end. Um, so we kind of fly blind with these things. So one of those things that we're working on in the lab here is to think about um, what happens to that char layer and the convective heat flux, which is one of the biggest contributors. And so essentially we're, we're built a model, we've put it in our high density tunnel here and we've built 3D roughness patterns where we have different gauges, which will have um, measure that heat flux. So we do it in three ways. We can do it either A, with a, a silver calorimeter gauge where we measure the temperature of a lot lumped mass, and we can then infer back what the heat flux was. We measure the surface temperature with an IR camera, and again, have a, a way of back processing to the heat flux. And the final is, um, thin film gauges, which are just essentially resistors, which um, change their resistance depending on temperature. And so we can back out again, heat flux from those. And you can see the, these are really heat flux augmentation numbers. So as we move down that rough plate, you can see we're getting incredibly high um, heat fluxes, particularly on the tips of these things. So that's where you start getting um, shearing, because these heat fluxes are so incredibly high, the material becomes very weak, even though it might be a carbon fiber, and start start getting sheared away. So that that's really the motivation that you're getting very very high heat fluxes on the top and above what we just predict from a, a, a simple turbulent boundary layer over the top because it's so rough. These these roughnesses tend to be on order of the size of the boundary layer. Um, so that's good for, for space vehicles, but what if you're interested in flying a more aerodynamic um, vehicle? So a glide vehicle or um, may, maybe a space plane. Um, so I've plotted, taken those two axes we saw a little bit earlier of heat load and heat flux, and then replotted all of those different missions. And so what you're seeing is when I put in that big blue bubble for a hypersonic glide vehicle that although the heat flux is kind of things we've flown before in Earth's atmosphere, so the Apollo missions, Hayabusa, the heat load is nothing like what we've done before. And if you want to get to, to higher aerodynamic efficiencies, you need smaller radiuses. And that's just gonna drive it high to higher heat fluxes and higher heat loads. So it, it, it's how do we deal with this? So one potential avenue would be to, to go to a really super duper material in the future, like ultra high temperature ceramics. And they, they, they have some promise. So, you know, we can get up to really high temperatures. So we're seeing with hafnium carbide there, 4,500 Kelvin, because we can re-radiate out lots and lots of, um, energy, which will therefore do our cooling. Um, so that's, that's fab. We, we might be able to just get away with a passive system with these new, new fancy materials. Um, the only issue is that these things don't work above about a thousand Kelvin in air because they just 
get destroyed by oxidation. Um, so that becomes a bit of an issue. So uh, we've been doing some work here over the last five years, um, thinking about whether we can pass uh, an inert gas out through a porous part of this ultra high temperature ceramic and create a little buffer layer between it and the oxides which are existing in our shock layer and protect, protect our, our leading edge so it can actually just then re-radiate out. Um, and to show you some of the tests that one of our students performed um, over in Stuttgart in a plasma wind tunnel. So um, the plasma wind tunnel test is shown on the left. Um, you can see the probe head, which would have been facing the, the flow there. And in the middle, you can see some ultra high temperature ceramic that's actually porous. So the close up microscope image is on the right and you can see it's made up of little spheres that are fused together. And you can see it's kind of porous. So if we don't do any cooling, it oxidizes and gets destroyed very quickly. It doesn't survive very long at all. But if we start passing some nitrogen through it, it survives completely. So it proves the point that we can actually block any of these oxides getting to the surface by creating a gas layer. But what we pay for over a passive system is higher complexity in, in, in the engineering solution. So there's more risk of failure of this thing. Okay, um, I've got about 10 to 15 left. So I'll try and get through just a bit of what we do here with wind tunnels. So um, most people might have seen or um, at least you know heard of a wind tunnel before. So the original creators of this were, were the Wright brothers to, to start thinking about um, you know, their, their aerofoil shapes for, for wings on planes. And so um, essentially it was just a little fan with um, a nice little square test section where they could put in different aerofoils and measure pressure and lift coefficients um, and drag coefficients on these aerofoils. And you know, essentially for low speed wind tunnels, the modern, modern um, wind tunnel is essentially just a super scaled version of it. Essentially, they've got much bigger fans and much bigger test sections to the point where they can even fit in whole, you know, or scaled versions of Formula One cars. And they've got lots more measurements that might take laser diagnostics, but essentially that, that stayed the same. Um, but hypersonic wind tunnels are a bit more challenging. Um, we can't quite make them out of um, timber and perspex. So uh, if you want to, to drive a hypersonic flow, essentially you normally start from a stagnation region um, where, you, where you're going to have hundreds, of, um, hundreds to thousands of bar of pressure and really, really high temperatures. Um, and that flow is then going to pass through a converging diverging nozzle and then over to onto a scaled model. And the difficulties come that, you know, if we want to get to, a, to decent model sizes or to replicate our non-dimensional quantities that we want to, like Reynolds number, um, you're going to have to, to, to have a nuclear power plant sat next to you to, to drive this thing. Um, you know, the pressures are high and you've got to contain them in that stagnation region. So it's, you know, you bottom of the sea sort of levels of pressures. Um, the heating is like an order of magnitude higher than on the space shuttle um, main engine throats, which were completely ablative and replaceable. Um, we've got to deal with these things in, in testing. Um, so we have to match the gas composition that's natural in the atmosphere. And if you start with a really, really hot gas in that stagnation region and then pass it, expand it back out, it might not have enough time to, to come back to, to a nice you know, oxygen nitrogen mixture. More likely you've got a lot of nit um, NO sat in your flow, which means you're not matching the gas composition. Or if you use a vitiated heated facility where you're burning fuel and burning the oxygen, you're definitely not matching it. And, and ultimately, if you're interested in boundary layer transition experiments, whatever drives the processes from the left there, 
can't be causing huge fluctuations and you can't have a, a transition of your boundary layer on the nozzle walls radiating in a bunch of noise. So we've got to think about it a bit further. So to have a look at what sort of hypersonic wind tunnels there are, I'm bringing us back to that same plot of trajectory. Um, if we want to have a continuous wind tunnel, they're, they're essentially pretty cold and um, very low speed in, in comparison. Um, so, but there is one exception and that's plasma wind tunnels, which can run continuously, but they don't match any of the other aerodynamic quantities. So they're good for, for materials testing, but they're not very good for any of the aerodynamics or radiation or convective heat flux problems. Um, so if we look at blowdown tunnels, there's, there's various different types. Um, there's ones where you store a lot of hot air or pass them through heaters on the fly. Um, and then you pass it through that converging diverging nozzle into a big vacuum tank at the end. So high pressure wants to go to, towards low pressure. And they, they, they allow us to get run times of seconds to hundreds of seconds. Um, and they can go up to, to reasonably high temperatures um, if you've got enough money. You know, we're talking hundreds of millions if you want to start getting up to, to 1900 Kelvin. Um, but that's only just starting to tickle where you're getting oxygen dissociation. So the only facilities that really can get us up to those super high enthalpies are shock tunnels. Um, and then you, you're only getting test times on the order of milliseconds to microseconds. Um, and you, you're taking half a day to set up an experiment. Um, and that the largest one of these in the world um, is over 300 meters long. I think it weighs over a megaton of steel and they produce a swimming pool full of water at the end. Um, just from the condens, uh, from they, they use a hydrogen oxygen detonation driver um, to drive the whole processes and it eventually creates water and that then has to be pumped back out at the end of the test. But, you know, we still can't match everything in that shock tunnels and we don't have enough test time for everything. So the next scale up of well, what could we do for an experiment is you can go have a ballistic range. Um, and there's a few of them around the world. Um, they, they actually are rarely operated. Um, I was lucky enough to visit um, G range over at ADC. Um, it's a crazy bonkers facility. It's um, a kilometer long underground um, it uses a detonation behind a piston to drive then a compression process of a projectile that's then flung out through a vacuum chamber and it just, you measure its flight and any of the other characteristics you want as it free flies down the tunnel for a kilometer and then passes through, you know, a good couple of, you know, 100 millimeter steel plates at the end to capture it. Um, but again, you're still dealing with, you know, teeny tiny 100 millimeter models, uh, but at least you're free flying and you can start looking at stability and, you know, you've got clean air, you don't have to worry about that. Um, but the real deal is you want to go fly. And so, you know, that, that's, that's where you can get clean air, clean geometries, but to run an experiment on a sounding rocket, we're, we're talking about 50 million pounds per per test. And um, at least what I've seen in hypersonic flight experiments, um, your chance of actually succeeding is about 30%. So you want to build three of those to make sure you do get it right. So you're talking 150 million pounds to go, go fly one of these hypersonic experiments. So what we've done here in Oxford um, over the last six or seven years is to develop um, really uh, three different high-speed wind tunnels. And I'm gonna focus really on the first two. Um, so the first is the T6 stalker tunnel, and that can match all that thermochemistry, which I was talking about earlier, but it's limited in test time um, down to the kind of microsecond to millisecond range. Um, so when we want to do longer duration testing or maybe higher Reynolds number or higher pressure testing um, to match um, some, some of the lower altitude conditions and lower Mach number conditions, 
Um, we can move across to the tunnel on the right there, the high intensity tunnel. Um, and so you're really trading off um, your, your, your speed capability for time cap capability. But it's um, all quite nice because both tunnels are sat in the one lab and we can test models in both tunnel. Uh, we can test models in both tunnels. So we share a lot of the equipment between the two. Um, so to take you through a little, just a taster of what these tunnels do. Um, the T6 tunnel is um, a free piston driven facility. So it has a either a 30 kilo or a 90 kilogram piston that gets flung down the tunnel. Um, and it, it gets up to about 300, 400 meters a second. Um, travels about five meters and then decelerates very rapidly pulling 10,000 G. So the big mild steel part on the left is really just inertial damping weight because the stress waves become too high um, for us to handle in an engineering perspective. And once that, that gas in the driver is compressed to high enough pressures, it will rupture a, a, a steel plate, which could be a couple millimeters thick and that high pressure, high temperature drive gas wants to then shovel the, the, the lower pressure test gas down to the right. And it will use mechanisms like shock waves to, to heat that gas up. We then feed it out onto models typically, but as I showed you earlier, it could be a shock tube experiment where we just take an image as the shock flies past. And so you can see on the right, you know, these are really the shots we've been doing over the last six months in blue. Um, and you can see we've kind of spread ourselves around in looking at different conditions from higher boos of return all the way back to um, some of the Mars return conditions. Um, so the high density tunnel um, is a Ludwig tunnel. So essentially it operates um, by having a big high pressure, high, temp um, high pressure reservoir at reasonable temperatures, a couple hundred degrees C. Um, and then we have a fast acting valve, which is just below, behind that red um, gate valve. And it flows through a converging diverging nozzle onto a model. And so, so this experiment here was measuring boundary layer instabilities. So we had um, five megahertz Schlieren running, um, which measures the density gradients in the flow. And you can see those little kind of rope-like features um, build up. And they're, they're the precursor to turbulent spots growth and then eventually turbulence downstream. So it's can we understand those processes of um, boundary layer instabilities, which then eventually lead to, to transition. And so you can see where our tunnel sits in comparison to some of the other big tunnels around the world. And when I say big, I mean big. Um, they're kind of, you know, you can, you can fit two humans standing on each other's, um, with one standing on each other's uh, shoulders in these tunnels, they're, they're very big. Um, the difference with our tunnel is we can go to very, very high field pressures, um, which allows us more Reynolds number capability. Um, I didn't have enough time in this talk to, to really talk about um, aerodynamics much, but I thought it's a really cool video, so why not show it? Um, so this was a test done by one of our fourth years who's now a DPhil student um, a few years ago where we free fly some of our models in the test section um, and we image them at high speeds and from, from tracking them, we can then back out the aerodynamic coefficients of forces and moments. And you can see here that um, this space plane isn't very statically stable because it just picks up and doesn't really fly where you'd want it to. Instead of flying straight backwards, it flies up very, very rapidly. Um, so thank you very much for, for having me uh, speak today and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, great, thank you so much. Um, Professor McGilvray, if you'd like to stop sharing, I can. Um, got a couple questions here coming in. Um, thank you so much for that uh, very comprehensive talk. Uh, it's really fascinating to see a lot of the videos and images you included as well. Um, quite an impressive facility that you that you're running. 
Um, so I'm going to jump right in if that's okay. So yeah, one, no, that. Uh, one question, which is, uh, in a hypersonic craft, how would the internal temperature be moderated so that internal components aren't superheated? Presumably, there is a great deal of absorption. Uh, a, a really good question and insightful as well. Um, so hypersonic vehicles, um, it, it, it depends on the vehicle, actually. So um, some will try and run a cold structure. So you, you ensure that your heat shield on the front um, never has any heat soakage into the vehicle because you can use um, radiative shields between that very hot object at the front and your substructure. Um, but once you get up, up to enough flight duration, you're going to get it in there. So that works for kind of shorter duration flights. Um, so you know, re-entry type, type flights, that, that might work. But if you're doing longer crews, um, you, you then have to, to use um, hot structures. So you're gonna have to deal with the fact that you, you're hot. So you wanna actually get some of that heat away to, to the back of the vehicle where it might be cooler for it to just re-radiate out. So it's, it's a game of, well, you're going to have to design for, for having hot, hot bits in there, but it's all about, can you get the conduction pass to, to where you can re-radiate out back, back in the space and, and convect if you can get the flow cold enough again. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so there's another question. What are the benefits of using active cooling over opting for um, ablative technology, which uh, you kind of- uh, Yeah. I I think I actually more effective is one over the other. Um, um, it's hard to beat ablators, just as an as an honest um, opinion of someone who's researching transpiration cooling and active cooling. Um, ablators are very lightweight for the amount of cooling they can give you, extremely lightweight. Um, now the 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 two bits is if if you have a for a sharp leading edge, there's an obvious thing that with an ablator. You know, you're trying to have a sharp leading edge for aerodynamic efficiency. So you want it as sharp as possible. We're talking down to the millimeter scales. Um, and if you have an ablator, you'll very soon not have a very sharp leading edge. So you've kind of lost the game of why you wanted to, to have a um, sharp leading edge. So that's why we're investigating this technology for it. Um, the second, well, there, there, there's quite a few more in terms of military applications. So it could be observability, you know, carbon coming off an ablator is very, very pronounced. Um, it radiates like all hell. Um, it could be also protection of IR windows and sensor windows where you actually want to see out of them. So having an ablator come past with a lot of carbon um, is a bit of an issue. Um, but what you pay for with any active cooling system is the complexity budget. Even if the mass is comparable, which it probably won't be, a blader will be lighter, um, the complexity goes up enormously. So you really would want to, you have to have good reasons to go to it. Um, you, you would choose if, everyone will choose an ablator every day of the week, unless you've got very specific needs. And reusability is probably one of the highest that if you want to have a space plane that flies continuously, if you have an ablator, you've got to change it every time. Mm. When the spacecraft lands, you've got to strip the whole thing off, put on a new ablator, and that obviously leads to higher risk that something's going to go wrong. Okay. Okay. Um, have you worked on dynamic or moving models, for example, deployable structures, and what challenges do you face when working with models like these um, in hypersonic testing? Than models that stay the same size and form? Good question. No, I haven't. Um, it is something that um, we're, we've talked around multiple times, um, never actually done. Um, it, very, very challenging um, to have <laughs> moving bits within a test. Um, we have a couple of DFILs that are just starting to look at control systems. So starting with flaps and other parts and looking at control of these things. But deployables um, is another level of complexity um, because you know, your control of those um, will, will be difficult. People have done them in these sort of facilities, um, but they are a difficult experiment. Okay. Right. Um, why not use internal conduction lasers to shoot down the ionization laser layer, sorry, to lower temperature to a more operable range? it can be coupled with the active heating system. Might have to ask for that one again, if that's okay. 
<laughs> do not use internal conduction lasers to shoot down the ionization layer to lower temperature to a more operable range? Um, okay, so the, the, I'm not quite sure I know what um, that sort of laser is, so I'll just preface it at the start, but um, maybe I can talk about certain things which are interesting around that thought. Um, so um, one of the interesting things that you could do and people have thought about is um, actually having a laser and focusing it in front of a vehicle and essentially mimicking what an aero spike does. So that an aero spike is a little object that you can put out the front of your vehicle, which means that the shock to, to your vehicle, it looks like you've got a, um, the shock's not sitting right in front of you. You've got something to break it in front of you. And what that can do is reduce drag because your shock's not as blunt. You've actually got, you recover more pressure back, back on the vehicle. Um, so that, that's a kind of a neat thing that people use lasers for. Um, now, people have thought about all kinds of crazy, you know, magneto hydrodynamic effects and lasers like that. But anyone that does a simple calculation and sees how much power you need for these things and how big the lasers are and how much they weigh, start scratching their heads pretty quickly that you know, you're 10 times to 100 times the weight of your vehicle very quickly. Okay. Um, there are people that are interested in, for, for cooling reasons, using um, these strange materials that can, when they get up to high temperatures, that they can pass out free electrons and actually you're giving off energy by giving off these electrons. So you're getting rid of some of the heat through just generating them, but you've got to collect those electrons back or otherwise you're going to get a deficit pretty soon and stop the process. Um, but in, in terms of, um, yeah, that they're the technologies that people are exploring, but I, I tend to find them, uh, unless there's a huge game changer in terms of mass weight space, it's, we're talking hundreds of years away for those technologies to ever come online. Okay, wow. Um, sort of along the vein, you mentioned Magneto. So it says, uh, there's one question, if you have dissociation of molecules, can you use a magnetic field to force the plasma away from the surface? It, the answer is yes, yeah. And, and people do look at that very directly. So really good thought and um, people are researching it. I think it's just the practicality of mass that's the, the killer for that system. Um, rather than the actual physics and, you know, understanding the physics and knowing how to control it in, in a nice way. Um, people have shown uh, initial results that look actually quite promising. Um, I think it's just that the technology build of those systems is, is more the, you know, the difficulty and again, complexity. You know, just anything that adds complexity to a spacecraft you want to remove because you know the risks are very high that you're going to lose it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what are the major challenges and differences for Mars missions versus gas giant entry versus ice giant entry and how do we study these on Earth? <laughs> Good question. Um, I'm literally going to be called downstairs to, to, to to look at Mars entry in a very little bit. And we've just kicked off a PhD program um, to look at ice giant entry. Um, so we're very interested in all them. Um, so differences. Um, so for Mars is where we're probably going next with humans, right? If we're going to go venture out. Um, so currently we've landed little robots there that have driven around, that's really cool. Um, but if we want to get humans there, we need lots a much, much bigger vehicle um, to, to enter Mars. And that means much bigger shock layers. So the radiative heating back to the vehicle goes up. Um, so from an engineer's perspective, it means that we, we want to know more about um, that radiative heating um, than we ever had before, because it just didn't matter for the smaller probes. But now we're getting bigger and bigger, the amount of gas that's compressed on the front that can then radiate back is increased. Um, and in particular, there's big uncertainty on, uh, interestingly, on the back shell of vehicles, so not where the hot plasma is. Once it's expanded out, it, it can 
it can actually stay energized for certain vibrational states of um, of CN, which radiate in the midwave infrared and can pound back. And so it means that you might actually need, you know, they're predicting quite thick bits of TPS on the back of these vehicles um, because of the high uncertainty there. Um, so uh, the major difference is speed and gases, probably as a general statement. <laughs> speed, and, speed and gases. So Mars entry is gentle seven kilometers a second, and it's mostly CO2 with a little bit of nitrogen. Um, when you go into the ice giants and the gas giants, uh, you're, you, you're talking hydrogen helium systems mm -hmm. and you're talking 20 kilometers a second or above. Wow. Um, <laughs> so, it, and radiative heating goes up with about velocity to the power of four, I think, off the top of my head. Uh, so the, the amount of heating rapidly goes up um, due to that. Uh, it's uh, the, the amount of radiative heating for hydrogen helium systems isn't as high as you'd expect at 20 kilometers a second because um, it hangs, you know, things don't quite getting as energized as they would, but for Jupiter, it's just all radiation. It's huge. Um, we've actually got loads of questions coming, but I think in the interest of time, um, I'll ask one more question and after that, a general question that, that we tend to ask. Yep. Well. So uh, what are the next developments in the lab and what is the next big progress to be made in hypersonics? <laughs> God, what's the next progress in the lab? Um, that's a really great question. Um, so I, at the moment, um, I think we've got quite, we're, we're kind of, we've got a lot of students working on transpiration cooling work, but I think that's kind of, you know, we're kind of moved that up a little bit in the TRL chain. Um, what, what's going on with that. Um, I think probably I would suggest that my, my new colleague, uh, Tobias Herman, is probably doing the most exciting thing that could happen um, in terms of development. So he's thinking about combining one of those plasma wind tunnel facilities with our short duration shock tunnel. And if you can do that, it means you can do hot, hot surface temperature or ablative testing coupled with the wind tunnel flows. So because we have such short durations, the models stay cold. They'll only rise by a couple of degrees Kelvin over our test times. But if you could preheat them and get the ablation started mm. and then pass the flow over them, you can actually start thinking, well, okay, well, uh, we might be able to do realistic coupled studies of the aerodynamics and the ablative together. Um, so I'd say that's probably the, the most exciting and the, the grandest challenge um, when it comes to, to a, I guess, the experimental side. Um, in terms of generally what's, what's happening, um, well, Ice Giants is probably the most interesting or Titan entry at the moment in terms of if I want to think space, because um, there's, a, there's a window to get to the Ice Giants and NASA and ESA are considering it. Um, going after it as a combined mission. Um, so we're doing kind of first phase low, low TRL studies to see what, what the capability is required um, for those. And Titan, they're going to go fly a quadcopter. So one of my best friends from undergrad is leading the, the NASA Dragonfly mission. So they're going to try and get into Titan and fly a quadcopter around. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so last question. Um, Something that we ask all of our speakers, um, what advice would you give for early career researchers looking to refine their research focus and just any general advice? <laughs> um, take a chance. <laughs> it was the, it was the, I, I remember I, I didn't know what a PhD was when I started. So, you know, I can't say that I, I had really thought too deeply about my future career coming out of undergraduate. And I was lucky enough to, to have a, a mentor and a supervisor that you know, saw something in me as a fourth year and asked me to do one. Mm -hmm. And I remember I quandered about it for a while. And I remember talking to my father who said, just take a chance, you're not gonna lose anything. You know, you've got plenty of years to do a boring job when you crank the wheel. Yeah. Might as well just go after it. Yeah. That's great. 
Well, thank you so much. I'm really sorry to the viewers that's all posting questions. Um, we've run out of time, but thank you so much for, for the excellent presentation and for all the question, questions as well. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And um, we'll be back next week with uh, another talk, this time on, on space policy with um, the UN um, Outer Space Affairs Director, Simonetta Di Pipo. So be sure to tune in for that. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.